You're listening to the Huddle Up! Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up! Podcast, presented as always by Mile High Huddle and 24-7 Sports. I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me, as always, is my partner in crime. You know him and love him. Is your Denver Broncos reporter for 24-7 Sports. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, no sooner did the veterans and the rookies descend on the field at the same time at Dove Valley did a veteran go down with injury. We must bid adieu, it looks like, to the kind of journeyman, young, maybe not quite journeyman, but the young offensive lineman, Nico Fala. Yeah, it sounds like, Chad, that he suffered a uh, torn Achilles tendon, which would end his season more than likely. It's a tough you know, blow in this stage of the offseason program to go down. He was doing uh, drills off to the side and just went down in a heap, couldn't put any weight in his leg. So it looked ominous at the start. And uh, it sucks. You know, injuries are unfortunate and they're inevitable. I don't want Broncos fans to go start blaming the coaching staff now. I mean, these things are going to happen, unfortunately. Yeah. What I've been told from people who were at practice – today, and we're recording this Monday, most of you will be listening on Tuesday, is that even though they weren't in full pads, it actually kind of looked a lot more like a training camp practice in terms of its yeah. uh, meter and intensity and tempo than it did kind of a lackadaisical OTA under John Fox or even Vance Joseph. And, you know, there's something to be said for that. I don't think that's the reason Fala got injured. I mean, freak accidents and freak injuries are are freak injuries, and you, sometimes you have to charge it to the game. You just hope that it's not something that ends up being, you know, a pattern as they go into the summer. But, you know, you can figure every team, you know, right now the roster's at 90 guys, Zach, you can figure that by the time the season's over, there's probably going to be another 10 to 15 guys like this that suffer significant injuries and even more than that who are banged up. And what scares me, though, is last year under Lauren Landau, the Broncos had so many lower body injuries, Chad. I mean, just look at Ronald Leary. Just look at Emmanuel Sanders. Two Achilles injuries right there. Now another one right away. So hopefully it's – not hopefully in Fala's case, but hopefully it's just a freak accident. It's not a sign of things to come. I actually like the fact that Fangio cranked up the intensity, get these guys rocking and rolling early. And it's not club men until training camp now. We're going to talk about what – took place on day one of OTAs, the highlights, some of the takeaways from what was said, what we saw. But first, a reminder, make sure you're following the show on Twitter. Super easy to do. Open up the app. Open up the the browser, twitter.com. Find at HuddleUpPod. Click the follow button. That's the easiest way to keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening with the show in real time. And then don't forget to leave your creative review and rate the show on iTunes. Give us that five-star rating. All right, Zach, so... Just to kind of piggyback on what we were talking about, you know, this does look and feel different for an OTA. And as we know, Vic Fangio has been patiently biding his time for, well, since the 80s, right, as, a, as either a linebacker's coach or defensive coordinator in the NFL. And he's been watching all these different head coaches do things. He's picking things out here that he likes, He's things that he knows don't, doesn't work or whatever. And he's thinking, someday I'm going to get my shot. And when I do, here's how I'm going to do things. And he's finally got that shot. He's finally got the opportunity where this is his animal, right? This is the way uh, he's always envisioned it. And it's kind of interesting to see how it, how it's taken shape. And I'm even more curious to see what this thing looks like when training camp finally rolls around. Yeah, when they take the training wheels off more. I mean, you can already see the Broncos team of this year under Fangio. It's no BS. It's all work. It, it's it's straight to the point, and it's going to be a hard-hitting, um, intense team with a lot of focus. So it's very encouraging at this early stage that I'm not trying to overreact to, Chad, at this point. Here's what I'll say, though, and here's where I will read a little bit deeper into this, is this is a guy who is getting out ahead of it really quickly to – kind of set a precedent, right? He's he's yeah. sending a message to the guys who are carryovers from last year's roster, plus the 30 or 40 new faces and the new coaches that are working with him now too, that this is the model, this is the standard, this is what we expect. And it's really quite a marked difference from Vance Joseph who, I mean, let's face it, he didn't know what he was doing. And if you talk to players and even media, guys that I know, who were at every single OTA practice last year, every single training camp practice, they'll tell you, especially contrasting it with Kubiak and now contrasting it with Fangio, 
he didn't have any idea what he was doing. And I don't want to derail this podcast into Vance Joseph land. But what I'm getting at is Vic Fangio, he's got to kind of overcome that, right? Two seasons in a row, back-to-back losing seasons for the Denver Broncos, and three without making the playoffs after carrying off the, the Lombardi Trophy in Super Bowl 50. He has got to plant a, a stake in the ground right now and make sure everyone understands that there's a new sheriff in town, there's a new standard what this team's been through in the most recent past, it's ancient history. And if you don't get on board the train right now and do things the Fangio way, you're going to get left in the dust. I, death by inches, it wasn't just a catchy phrase or a t-shirt. I mean, that's what he really lives by. No death by inches. No shortcuts. No easy way outs. Uh, nothing like we saw the last couple years. Nothing like we've seen in a while, Chad. I mean, he's a authoritative voice the Broncos needed, the kick in the behind they needed, and he's going to light that fire. And I'm glad it started right away in day one of his press conference, introductory presser. He said that I'm going to do things my way and they're going to listen to me. And he had that room full of Broncos players at his press conference all tuned in. So you knew right then he was already garnering their respect. Another thing I like about it in terms of what the implications are is that, you know, Vance Joseph, even though all I think all head coaches operate under a certain kind of understood sense of urgency because they know there's only 32 jobs of that kind in the world and it's put up or shut up type thing but a new young guy in his 40s he thinks he kind of feels like he's got all the time in the world so to speak Vic Fangio's 60 and he's waited his whole entire uh, professional life for this opportunity he knows that the natives are restless in the fan base he knows ownership or let's just say the trust is restless John Elway is about jumping out of his skin. He's so sick of all this losing. And so he's he's cranking up the intensity, and he knows, too, that, look, I've got to get results sooner rather than later. This can't be a mail-it-in type of year. You know, let's see how they do. This is, to me, Zach, I know it's just one OTA practice, but this is another example in my mind that Vic Fangio is not expecting to go into the 2019 season and just kind of, you know, let's see what we can do and some kind of modicum of improvement over last year. This guy's coming in to compete. I mean, the standard is set where it should be, Chad, and, and he, he kind of reminds me of Bill Belichick in the sense where if the Broncos win, he's not going to celebrate it. He's going to say, on to whatever. That's the type of mindset we need. Focus, uh, pick up victories where you can, get this team back on the right track. It's a very explosive locker room, lots of different personalities. It's a very, uh, it's like a pilot fuse. It's very short-lit. So he needs to bring them all in, and I think he's done a good job for a first-time head coach with all these, all these new moving pieces around him and working under a guy like John Elway. I think Fangio, at this point, has done a pretty good job. Speaking of all those personalities in the locker room, we finally got to hear from Joe Flacco, of course, for the first time since the draft. Now, of course, in the, in the OTAs that took place at Dove Valley not long before the draft, Flacco was asked, about the prospect of the Broncos, who at the time held the 10th overall pick, taking a quarterback there. And as we can all remember, he made basically said that, you know, if it was up to me, no. You know, if it's up to me, we invest in me and the team as is and build as good a team around me as, as, as possible as myself being that understood quarterback. Flash forward a couple of, you know, two, three, four weeks, whatever it might be from that point, and you've got a shiny new first-round caliber quarterback taken in the second round named Drew Locke, who's a similar player to you. He's got the big arm. He's got the size. He's a more athletic player, definitely. But now the threat is real. The Broncos went and did it. And so Flacco's saying now, here's what he said uh, on Monday. Here's what he said, quote, Listen, I've told you guys how I felt about it. There, There really isn't much more that needs to be said. I told you that it's not really in my control, close quote. And then... I'm going to serve this over to you here, Zach. Then he went on, he was asked by someone there in the media, you know, the idea of, do you take it upon yourself to mentor Drew Locke? Is that your responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not going to read the entire quote, but basically what he said is, that's not my my job. Okay, my job is to go out there and win football games for this team. So, Zach, what we're just kind of reading his body language, reading his tonality, you know, of course, also the content of what he said what were your takeaways from Joe Joe Flacco in his response to Drew Locke hitting this roster? Uh, first, let me say, ultimately, I agree with what Flacco is saying. It's not his job. The Broncos pay millions of dollars to coaches 
to develop and tutor these quarterbacks. It's not his job to babysit. He's not running a preschool. His job, like he said, is to win football games. My problem with it is it's how he delivered it. It came off kind of tone deaf. It came off kind of bitter, Chad. Like he was still mad about last season with Lamar Jackson and what happened with the Ravens. No one is asking him, and he even knows that Drew Locke's not expecting him to just uh, hold his hand. I mean, he has to know that too. It's part of being a leader. It's to build up those around you, even if those are trying to take your job. I mean, it's not written into your contract specifically, but he is a leader of this team. And by proxy, those under him are looking up to him. It's not his job, but I think he could have handled that answer a little differently, a little more gracefully. It just came off to me like he's still smarting and he was too in his feelings with that answer. Well, I think we kind of have to understand, you know, from a temperamental perspective, from a personality perspective, charisma this is not Peyton Manning, right? Peyton Manning knew how to give the right answer and do it with panache and make people smile and feel good and then move on to the next thing. I mean, of course, he had his lapses time to time, but Joe Flacco's not the most outgoing, wordy, you know, eloquent speaker. So pushed into a corner, being asked, and this was actually two questions in a row in his defense. He was asked how Locke can learn from him, and he kind of went through and said, you know, I hope he does well, you know, blah, 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 blah. I'm not a selfish person. But, you know, that's kind of Rich's job, basically. And then he was asked again almost the exact same question. So I can understand how he's kind of like, look, I kind of already told you it's Rich's gig. That's not my job. My job is to go out and win football games. I loved it, Zach. I loved 100% everything he said. I had no bones with the way he said it. And I think if you're Drew Locke hitting this, this, you come off a rookie mini camp where, you know, you're the big stud and everyone's writing about you and all the videos and Twitter and everything's about Drew Locke and, you know, all the teammates and rookies are excited to be around Drew Locke. Then you get here and you're, it's kind of reality setting in. You're seeing Joe Flacco out on the field. Now you're in the meeting rooms with him. You're watching film with him. And I think it's kind of a paradigm shift for Locke where, He's got a, you know, you take it as motivation, hopefully, if you're Drew Locke, but kind of a reality check that, look, I am at best right now the number two quarterback. And for what it's worth, people I talked to today said, you know, just in the same way that Locke looked, you know, head and shoulders above Brett Rippon in terms of just his natural ability over the weekend during rookie minicamp, I was told that out on the grass today during the portion that the media could watch, Joe Flacco just looked like a completely different player than those guys. He looked exactly like an 11-year vet. You know, Drew Locks used to be in the guy with the biggest arm on campus. Not anymore. Okay, he's still got the arm. Don't get me wrong. But this is not like a good example is this isn't like, um, how can I put this? This isn't like going back in time when Jake Plummer, you know, led the Broncos to three consecutive playoff berths, gets to the AFC Championship game, and, and loses, and so Shanahan, Mike Shanahan, drafts Jay Cutler. Jay Cutler hits the practice field, and that right arm of his immediately, you know, just throwing zingers, outshines Jake Plummer. And Jake Plummer had him beat in other areas, but, you know, it's not that kind of a contrast, right? For Joe Flacco, for Drew Locke, their arms are similar. And at least Joe Flacco, this is a guy that knows what it means to lead a team. This is a guy that knows how to, you know, how an NFL practice takes shape, how, you know, timing, all that stuff is already established. And from everyone I talked to today, it was very clear and apparent that Joe Flacco today, okay, day one of OTAs, Zach is, is by far the best quarterback on the roster. I mean, as he should be, though. And, you know, I agree with your premise, Chad, that it's exciting. And I I like the quarterback having this kind of a-hole attitude and the alpha attitude and uh, better than the all shucks of the Trevor Simeon or the Case Keenum. But uh, what did he expect after a, a month of not having media availability and the Broncos drafted a quarterback, the number one quarterback on Elway's board? What did he expect? He was going to get those questions, and he's been in the league long enough regardless where he should know how to answer that. It just seemed like he went out of his way to remind Locke and the public that he's not this kid's babysitter. I think that was understood. I mean, Elway came out right after the draft and said Joe's the starter and Locke would be competing for the backup job. He's not fearing for his job. He's not looking over his shoulder. So to me, I like it. It just came off his answer a little defensively. It just, it, he could have answered it a little better. The point still got across. I think Locke knew that. And rather than put the kid down right away, I think he kind of tried to be a little better of a teammate publicly, even putting aside his hurt feelings from last year. Yeah, I could see a little bit of defensiveness. Maybe, maybe not quite defensiveness. Maybe more of a guy who is bitter, okay, didn't like it, and he's trying not to show it. 
And at the same time, he's also trying to say, as he mentioned earlier in that answer, uh, you kind of got to be careful how you answer that. But here it goes. You know, he doesn't want to poison the well already with Drew Locke, right? He doesn't want to create an internal controversy of any sort. But you know what? If you're Drew Locke and you hear that, my job is to go win football games. My job's not to, you know, groom Drew Locke. If you're the player that the Broncos think you are, that's just motivation. I mean, what Joe Flacco said with regard to to Drew Locke basically was, hey, you know, little things. In fact, let me find the quote here real quick. And here's what he said. He goes, quote, I think I've talked about that before, too. That is probably along the lines of him being drafted. It's one of those things. There's definitely little things that motivate you every year. Now, if I'm Drew Locke and I hear that, you're calling me a little thing here? Okay. All right, Doc. It's on. You're calling me little like I'm an insignificant motivation to you? I mean, yeah, I'm I'm a second-round pick and all, but, dude, I'm coming for your job. And on one hand, you're right, Zach, that – you know, John Elway already christened him the starter, called it a Favre Rogers type of situation. There's no immediate urgency for Joe Flacco, like he's under threat of losing his job, even though he's still got to do enough to fend off Locke. But there's still no doubt that the clock's ticking. The clock's ticking on the Flacco era in Denver by virtue of that Drew Locke pick. I, it's definitely, there's no doubt, it's definitely on Drew Locke to take this and use this to his advantage and make the coaches think twice and make Flacco lose his job ultimately. That is definitely on Drew Locke. But he's done everything to this point that would suggest he has that work ethic. He doesn't need more motivation. He went and put on a uh, altitude training mask and, and got on the cardio machine. He went uh, and, and recited plays in the mirror after struggling in, in day one of Broncos rookie minicamp. So it's not his fault the Broncos drafted him. It's not his fault he's here. I mean, I don't. Flacco's anger, I think, is misdirected. I, I just still think he could have handled that question a lot better. One thing I liked, too, from Coach Fangio was he kind of reminded everybody that, look, you know, yeah, the onus is on Drew. It's not the, the onus is not on Flacco to bring Drew along. No, but he also reminded everybody that look, Joe's learning a new system himself. I mean, Joe only preceded Drew in Denver by maybe a month, six weeks, give or take, really, right? So when when history goes back and judges this competition, however it shakes out, that, I mean, they basically landed at the same time. It's very similar to how. Um, Peyton Manning preceded Brock Osweiler in Denver by a month, basically, a month and a half, right? Free agency to the draft. That's the only amount of time different that Peyton had in Denver on Brock Osweiler. And so they're going to, you know, they're, for better or for worse, their their trajectories, their resume, this period of their resume are going to be compared with each other. And so I'm hoping that Joe Flacco, and it sounds like it, the way he's playing, the way he's operating, it sounds like he's he's harnessing this as motivation in the right way. And if that's the case, it's going to pay dividends for the Broncos one way or another, both for Flacco and Locke, who, you know, maybe he didn't know what to expect, Zach, when he hit the locker room. But now he knows, all right, you know, this isn't (laughs) college, man. This is a guy, this guy's worried about losing his $60 million. And and I, I have to reckon with that. Yeah, now he knows he doesn't have a friend in Flacco. I mean, he has a competitor. It's a business, and I he I think he learned that, which is true. I mean, it's going to be a fight. I just feel like Flacco didn't have to go out of his way. He knew. I mean, this is his job. He is the understood quarterback. And really, Chad, is it a new system? I mean, they hired Scangarello, who hails from that same system, from the Kubiak tree. Uh, they tilted this whole thing in his favor. They got his blocking, his receiving weapons down. The Broncos are completely handed over the keys to Joe Flacco. So for him to drag Locke's name through the mud and say he's not his babysitter, we all knew that. Just go out and ball and take care of yourself. Yeah. To me, it's just a guy who's used to being the guy that had to, in a, I think it was kind of an understated way. I don't think it was too overt, but it was his kind of passive-aggressive way of letting the team know, letting fans know, letting media know that, yeah, that that irritated me. They didn't have to take a quarterback. They didn't have to take one of the top three quarterbacks. Okay? You know, they could have waited. They could have you know, did what they did with Rippon and brought in someone late. And maybe I'd take a a lot more kindly to bring in someone along like Rippon, taking in the seventh round or going undrafted, than Drew Locke, who is the SEC's all-time leader in single-season passing touchdowns with 44. So, you know, it's going to be interesting, Zach, to see how this thing shakes out. You know, this is just the beginning phases, the beginning stages of not only how the team is taking shape, but ultimately how this quarterback competition is going to unfold. And even though Flacco is the unquestioned starter and the Broncos are comfortable with that, Joe, uh, you know, Vic Fangio as a first-time head coach but also a longtime veteran coach 
he is his sympathies are always going to be with the veteran at this stage anyway. He's not going to really invest emotionally into a young player like Drew Locke at quarterback until and unless he has no choice. Right now, he wants results. If Flacco gives him the best opportunity to get those results, but it's really going to be interesting to see how this shakes out. You know, and we're going to get five preseason games. I mean, it feels like August is a, a long, many light years away at this point, but look at the bright side. We're going to get five preseason games to watch Locke and even though Flacco today, Zach, was clearly the better quarterback, and as you said, he should be. He should look like the better quarterback. He's in his 12th year. You know, this is his 12th OTA. I mean, he knows this, and he's obviously a former first-round pick. He won a Super Bowl. I mean, his bona fides are legit. He should look like the better player. I'm just curious now to see how Drew Locke ultimately kind of responds and reacts to these initial impressions and kind of feedback he's gotten finally mixing it up with the vets. I think this will finally separate the Drew Locke and the Pax and Lynch comparisons. A lot of Broncos fans, for whatever reason, compare the two. But Pax and Lynch would have went into a shell mentally right away with these comments. He would have never been the same quarterback. I think Locke has that moxie, that it factor to bounce back for him. And I think he'll add to that Pringle scan that he has. He'll have even more motivation. So it it ultimately could have backfired in Flacco's face if down the line these comments trigger this ascension from Locke being a backup to starter. It's going to be definitely interesting to see how it plays out. That it will. And we still have a couple more things we want to talk about from day one of OTAs. We're going to tackle all of that here in just a second. We'll be right back. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. All right, Zach, let's talk about Von Miller was the second vet uh, that hit the podium following Joe Flacco. And really, there wasn't much to be gleaned from his remarks other than what he really had to say about Chris Harris and He talked, I'm not going to read the quote or play the clip, but basically to paraphrase Von Miller, he stood up and stumped for Chris Harris in terms of he's his, you know, how deserving he is for a contract extension. His support continues to be unwavering for Harris in terms of holding out from OTAs. And he also talked about the fact, Zach, that Chris Harris, you know, that's basically he's family to Von Miller. I mean, they they entered the league the same year. They, this will be their ninth season playing together. And, you know, he's seen Chris. He's known Chris since before he had a kid. Now he's got three kids. He was talking about all that. And, and Von's been there through it all. And, he, you know, he's been through this exact same situation, wanting a new contract, having to hold out, creating a little tension, creating a little conflict. But eventually the business gets done. And if I'm boiling it down or reading between the lines, trying to summarize the whole thing, Zach, my take is that Von Miller seems pretty unperturbed that I don't think he's too worried that something's not going to get done. I think it, he's he's like, look, this is just kind of the way it goes. I don't fault him for what he's doing. The Broncos are going to do their posturing. Chris is going to do his. But in the end, I think the business is going to get done. I mean, who knows how to negotiate with Elway better than Von Miller? I mean, he had a hold out of his own, and it went so far that he was scrubbing Elway from his social media pictures. He knows how it works. And he and Harris are very, very close off the field. They're very good friends, like you mentioned, Chad. They both came up together in this league. They both have seen the rise and the fall of this Broncos defense, so many players moving around. And of course, he wants him to get his due. He mentioned it uh, a couple months ago or a month ago at the start of the offseason program. So it's no surprise there. Pretty much every single current or former Broncos player has said the same thing, that Chris Harris Jr. is worth what he's demanding. It's He he needs to be taken care of, and that's what Vaughn was doing, was kind of nudging indirectly Elway along and saying, pay this man, get this done, and don't drag this out any longer. Yeah, the, it's just not a distraction that really needs to be there. Because just like I said on yesterday's podcast, my opinion is the Broncos have planned all along that they're going to extend him. You know, this is all posturing to try and whittle down the the eventual nut, right? To whittle it down to as as low as they can possibly get it. I think the Broncos know they for and they've known for a long time that they plan on keeping Harris around for a while, and that they're going to have to pay him commensurately with what he's what he's worth. And Von Miller's saying, "Look, you know, get this done because the longer you wait to the longer you postpone the inevitable, okay." the more of a distraction it it can become. You don't have all hands on deck right now, even though it's just OTAs. You know, today, day one, this was the phase where they're finally able to get out on the grass, and instead of an offense going against air, they can run 11 on 11. And, you know, you want all your best players out on the field, and the longer that you do postpone it, the more opportunity there is for it to actually go off the rails. And one thing that I thought was interesting, Zach, is that – 
he was asked, Vaughn, whether or not it's difficult to take during contract negotiations to take things personally. And here's where I will quote him. He said, quote, I think both sides kind of take it personally, honestly. I think both sides kind of take it personally. Whenever you talk about money and contracts, I think both sides, it's not just the player. I think it's guys in the front office that take it personally too, closed quote. So I think that's true. I think there is some truth to that, even though in the end, everyone comes together once a deal gets done, and I think bygones become bygones. But right now, there's there's some hard feelings out there. I think John Elway did a... Uh, uh, his part to create those those hard feelings with that comment before the draft that yeah we're going to talk not till after the draft and I said by the way everybody I said we're going to talk about it that doesn't mean we're going to do anything that's right yeah and you know it, it, to this point I think the Broncos know they have Harris by the cashews they know that he's under contract for 2019 what is his recourse here sitting out the season and risking money and look how that worked out for Le'Veon Bell who's a more dynamic player at this stage of this career. I just think he's he screwed Chris Harris Jr. He can either come back and maybe the Broncos will sweeten his deal for 2019 before he hits free agency or maybe they'll lock him down. I just if he wants 15 a year, Chad, if he wants to be the highest paid corner, I mean, Miller's advocacy or not, it's just not going to happen. No way. Yeah, I don't think he's getting 15, but I do think a deal is going to get done. And um, the more I have thought about it, the more we've talked about it, the more we've analyzed it. I think a deal is going to get done. I think it's going to be something like three years maybe four years, for about 13 and a half. Clearly, clearly, unmistakably more than Kareem Jackson got. And maybe not number one in, you know, the the league for cornerback, but enough to where he's up there. You know, he's in the top five, and Harris can say, look, I'm a top five corner, and I am now. I can look at the bank account, look at all those zeros, and recognize and clearly see that I'm being paid commensurately. You know what? If he jumps to 13 or so, that's almost double what he's making now. So he can't look at that and cry any tears. And, and based on his Twitter activity, he's responding to fans. He, he's sharing pictures of the Broncos. I think he wants to stick around. This is not a player who's divorcing himself from the organization. I th- he he played all his cards, Chad. All his negotiating cards he played. Now he's out of them, and the Broncos still hold the leverage. So it's only a matter of time. I agree with you. He will get signed. It's just going to come down to uh, where they can meet in the middle in terms of average value. Another couple of quick things I want to talk about on today's pod, then we'll get out of here, is just the rave reviews. I mean, amidst all the hype of the Broncos drafting Drew Locke in the second round, is kind of going under the radar a little bit. Their number one pick, their first rounder, Noah Fant. And we talked yesterday, show, about how good he looked during rookie minicamp, going against rookies and going against air and, you know, a couple of tryout players and one undrafted rookie. And he looked just as good with the veterans going on one, uh, 11 on 11, going against real NFL defensive studs out there. I mean, the Broncos defense are legit, just like Joe Flacco said. And it looks as if it's not going to take long for him to develop a chemistry with Joe Flacco, which is great to see. Joe Flacco is certainly happy that the Broncos at least used that first round pick on a weapon and especially a, a tight end position that he loves throwing the ball to that's his security blanket is the tight end position and just from talking to guys today they're already building that chemistry and it looks like they're this it it didn't look like this was their first practice together no, and and as the the pads go on and, and contact comes on, uh, you're gonna see uh, Fant match against Von Miller and Bradley Chubb, and learn blocking. He's gonna really develop quickly, I think, into a starting caliber all around tight end. It won't be long until he ascends to the number one spot. I, it was a great pick uh, at that spot at that value, and they did it specifically for Joe Flacco, which is what I was saying earlier. They've tilted everything in his favor, so for him to come out and think he's doesn't have it all already, it's just uh, it, it rings pretty hollow. Another interesting thing, I. <laughs> I always think it's funny, you know, when when a team or the Broncos or any team for that matter, but when the Broncos bring in a slew of tryout players for rookie camp, you know, it usually goes by, and I understand why, but it goes by with a yawn in the fan base. No one could give a flying flip, you know. But the Broncos ended up cutting a few players to make room for some of those tryout players, including, and this was via Mike Kliss on Monday, The Broncos signed wide receiver slash tight end, Bug Howard, Jonathan Howard. They're going to try him at tight end. He's a big kind of, he played basically wide receiver. He looks, he wears Demarius Thomas's number right now, and he looks like him in terms of size and build as well. Jonathan Howard, they're going to play him at tight end. They also signed offensive lineman Nathan Jacobson 
defensive lineman Dion Sizer, and then former Bronco that's kind of bounced around the practice squad for the Broncos over the last couple of years, Deshaun Williams. And then the corresponding cuts included Tamarick Hemingway, whom the Broncos kept on the practice squad last year, the former L.A. Ram. And then he even was promoted to the active roster late in the season after the injuries. The undrafted rookie from this year, they just signed him, you know, a week and a half ago, Brian Wallace, and then cut him. Similarly, defensive lineman from Washington, Jalen Johnson, undrafted just a couple weeks ago, sign him, come to rookie camp, get your walking papers. And then Kashad Lyons, another defensive lineman who's been with the team, Zach, you know, as a as a fringe player, a bubble player for the last year and some change. But what were your thoughts on those roster moves on Monday? I don't have too many thoughts specifically. Uh, to me, uh, Williams was the biggest name to stand out among the players that they signed back. Uh, he was a favorite of Vance Joseph. And the, the Broncos and, Fa- and Fangio the last couple weeks or so in the draft and after that, they really prioritized the trenches, offensive and defensive linemen. I thought that was interesting. And they have two of the best coaches at the positions there. So there's definitely uh, influence in Dove Valley. Uh, Bug Howard, he's kind of that tweener, wide receiver, tight end, and he's another huge target, 6'4", 221. I mean, this, this Broncos team between Sutton and, and Patrick and Hamilton, they're just loaded with uh, huge offensive weapons right now. So it, it's not favorable for his chances of making the 53, but at this stage it's going to get a, a contract with the Broncos, and hopefully they can do something. You know how they say on Twitter, learn to code? Homeboy yeah. better learn to block because yeah, that's, right. that's that's what's in store for him. The biggest difference for him, of course, coming from being a wide receiver working on the outside to now working in line and having to block defensive linemen, not DBs, defensive linemen on first and second down. But he obviously showed enough over the weekend that they went, look, you know, Vic Fangio, uh, Rich Gangarello, they owe nothing to Tamara Hemingway. That's a guy acquired under the previous regime. They liked what they saw from Bug Howard, and so they're keeping him around. And, you know, like you said, with Fumagalli bouncing back, a fifth-round pick from last year, Jake Butt bouncing back, a fifth-round pick from the year before, now you got Noah Fant plus re-signing Jeff Hireman. It's kind of a logjam there. His odds, Bug Howard, of making the roster are slim. But I could see him, you know, his. I think his best-case scenario, I shouldn't say I could see him, his best-case scenario is – hanging around the practice squad, doing enough to hang around for a year or two. You know, a guy like Hireman hits the road or Jake, you know, doesn't work out with Bud or something, they have to cut him. And a year or two down the road, he's finally able to work his way onto the active roster. That's kind of the best case scenario for a player like Howard. But he is interesting. He, He is an intriguing player. Yeah, his his clearest clearest path to playing time if he settles in at tight end as opposed to receiver, I, he's not going to crack it at receiver. And I'm with you. His best case is a tight end. He needs to hope that Bud doesn't come back and Fumagalli is slow and Fan doesn't get up to speed right away and Hireman never recovers. It's not. It's it's a very uphill battle. And if he can make the practice squad though, Chad, after landing a tryout contract, that's a major major win. It's going to be a great couple weeks here, though. I mean, we've had oh, yeah. some dead time, but there's activities happening at Dove Valley with OTAs. 11-on-11, 11 11. we're going to get coaches and players pretty much every day after practice for the next few days. So it'll be uh, it'll be fun to rejoin you guys after Wednesday. Look for a, an episode of Building the Broncos. On Wednesday, I think they're going to be going through kind of breaking down expectations for the rookies or something like that. Uh, but in the meantime, that's going to do it for today's episode of the Huddle Up Podcast. Make sure you're following the show on Twitter, at Huddle Up Pod. You can find my partner, Zach Kelberman, on Twitter, at Kelberman247, myself, at Chad N. Jensen. Do not forget, everybody, to leave your creative review and give us that five-star rating on iTunes. And for those of you who are still on the lag wagon as it relates to becoming VIP subscribers, you got to pull the trigger. Go to milehighhuddle.com, look for the green banners to sign up. You can get your first month, you guys, right now for a buck. For a single dollar. So pull the trigger on that. That's better than you're going to find anywhere, including The Athletic. So check that out. But in the meantime, we'll be back on the other side of Wednesday. For Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. We'll talk to you guys soon. You've been listening to the Huddle Up! Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.